And my name is Berkeley Brethed. Thank you for coming. I appreciate that. Um, who would have thought 25 years later I'd be up here? Thank you. I'm having, I'm having more fun than I should after taking such a long break. So uh, first, let's do a quick review of the year. Before we do that, though, I'm kind of curious. How many, does anybody here know that I'm not doing this again, that Bloom County is back? Do most people know that? All right, good. Well, that's great news. Um, social media seems to work. So here's something my daughter put together. Um, and it's a quick review of the year and things in the past. So let's see if I can get it going. Then I'll come back. Sit down. Don't speak rubbish. Sit down. Sit down. 
Thank you. Uh, that was a lot of fun to put together. Those, um, you notice two entirely different opuses there are animated. Those are animated tests, animation tests done in the past 20 years, one, uh, only two of many uh, in the long pursuit of trying to turn Bloom County into a movie, which the fates probably faded would not happen for reasons you could almost see. Is it trying to nail opus it, with, a, with animation, movement, and voice was going to be tough, and it, it proved tough. Um, anyone re uh, recognize the narrator's voice the, uh, on the first one? John Cleese, of course. I discovered him in Santa Barbara walking down the beach and, and picked him up, sort of. Um, and he did that as a favor. Uh, who did Opus's voice in the second one? David Hyde Pierce, that's right. He was as close as I think uh, we got. Uh, the first one was done by the guys that, uh, that try to imitate for Warner Brothers, the Warner Brothers look of their cartoons from the 50s, which is why he, Opus, moved like Daffy Duck, which um, is it's exactly, if you were put Daffy Duck in that, that's exactly Daffy Duck, which he's not. So these are all fun experiments, but what's cool is I've had these in my vaults for 25 years, no one was ever going to see them. It was only seen by three or four people, executives. Um, so it's cool that I can show them again. So um, I hope you enjoyed that. So I'm back 25 years later. I've got a new book out. Um, I'm an author again. Um, yeah. Um, two books out, actually. I'll talk about the, the, the second one later. And I'll be signing afterwards, and I'm supposed to remember to say that before I leave. So 25 years later, um, it's a bloody good question, uh, why did I come back? Um, it's one I had to ask myself and explore, which is why it was kind of fun needing to do this for a speech and coming up with, and thinking about it long enough and coming up with some cogent explanations even for myself as to how I could have done something that I had promised would only happen if you know, the proverbial hell freezes over for 25 years. So um, I explored it, and I thought I'd share it with all, all of you today. Uh, and when I did think about it, it was, as these things do, the coming together of three things that ordinarily by themselves wouldn't mean that much, but they came together about a year ago um, very quickly, and the decision was made in about two and a half minutes, which is shocking even to me, and I sat down on my computer and dug up the old print and did it. So as, as I parse it back, um, there were three things. It was like a triad of, of, of influences coming together. Um, <laughs> one was uh, one of these children's books that I've done, uh, sp very specifically to develop as a film, which pretty much I, I did for that reason, most of my books. I left cartooning originally because I love narrative, I love storytelling. Doing a comic strip is very slow motion storytelling and I just wanted to try if uh, I could do some a little bit speedier f f storytelling which is not what you do actually if you think you're going to Hollywood. It actually slows it down. But it does more than that and I'm not the only author to have discovered this and it all came together in an unfortunate way with this particular book which was my favorite because it was born out of an idea that, uh, that suddenly popped into my head from a, a family crisis when my son was five. And he said something to his mother that he shouldn't have, that was shocking, and it sent her into tears. And he spun around and left for his room. As a storyteller does, I spun around and went to my room and wrote Mars Needs Moms, which is about a little boy named Milo, my son's name Milo, who says something horrible to his mom one day after, after being asked to do one too many chores and runs off to his room and his mom leaves in tears. And that night, unlike my spouse at the time, um, his mother gets kidnapped by Martians who don't have moms on Mars and they need moms and they think they know what they need moms for but they actually have it wrong. But they grab Milo's mother. Um, this is the tone of the book and I'm gonna reflect back on it, you might, you might notice. This is kind of, uh, the, the, it, was a, it was a allegory of motherdom and an allegory of love and allegory of, of family relationships. Uh, it was not a serious science fiction movie. Um, so that was the, the tone of it. It ends in a dramatic scene where Milo trips down 
the, uh, the, the staircase of the spaceship and is dying because his space, space helmet has broken and he's consuming Martian air. And his mother, who had been earlier kidnapped, comes over to him and in front of all the Martians, shows Martians what moms are really for. And she takes off her helmet and gives it to him while she slowly dies. That was the lesson that I wanted my son to, to, to walk away with. <laughs> So, and that, by the way, is exactly what Milo looked like at age five. It was the only time I've ever painted anybody that looks like actually himself. So, um, it, the, the, the story, the theme of the book is that uh, children, you may probably go through life and there really will only be one person, maybe two if you're lucky, that would actually die for you, despite what the, the love songs tell you. Only a couple people are out there that would be willing to do that. Step in front of a train for you. Don't take them for granted. Um, that was the idea. But it was not a serious science fiction movie. I sold it to Hollywood like I did all my books, and this one actually got made. And I sold it to my favorite filmmaker, the most trusted guy I would give it to, which is Robert Zemeckis, um, and with the most trusted company that I could think of, which is Walt Disney. And they put a budget of $160 million on this film. So I thought, what could go wrong? <laughs> well, this is what they made. So some of you may have heard of this. It slipped by the same year that they came out with uh, Nick Carter of Mars or whatever, the Jack, uh, John Carter of Mars. Disney has sworn off Martian movies for a long time, let me tell you. The same year, they lost about three or four hundred million dollars that year from Martian movies, mine being one of them. And the mistake was they turned this into a serious movie. It was never a serious movie. You do not leave humor out of animation. They broke the number one rule. This is the illustration I did for The Hollywood Reporter to show my, my characters um, as benign as I could draw them in their reaction to uh, the Disney movie, the version of themselves. So this is Donald Trump. <laughs> now you think that I drew this and I did not. This is a serious painting that Mr. Trump had commissioned for Mar-a-Lago. Um, the reason I have it here is because he's the second side of the triad of reasons why I happen to have come back. So about the same year that... <laughs> even though I have sworn off ever mentioning the word Trump in my strip again, which I have done, I'm gonna talk around it on the periphery, but he's not gonna get mentioned in my strip again, or nor will he be pictured, or nor will Bill the Cat wear his, wear his hair. Um, the reason I have this here is, yes, he had an influence. I was drawing him 25 years ago. He had crap to say about me then, by the way. I got good and insulted by him then. And when he emerged again, as I've said in a couple of other venues, I think of him as the reverse canary in the American coal mine. You know how they used to carry a live canary into a coal mine, and if he dropped dead, they'd know that they'd reach toxic air. This guy came up alive, and we knew because he'd come back alive, we had reached something new in the air, and that's what interested me, and that's what I didn't want to let go by as, as a cartoonist and satirist. So it's not him, he's, he's what rose from the swamp. He's actually quite boring as a character to satirize, he's almost impossible. But what's happening underneath him and behind him as we're experiencing the last couple of days is unprecedented. Who would want to miss that? So I'm sure Bill Maher um, would have thought the same thing if he was taking, it, uh, taking off for, for a few years, 25 like me. So he'd come back this year. So it was, it was a, a failure of a movie that shouldn't have failed, telling a story of mine that was precious to me. Uh, it was the political atmosphere emerging suddenly out of nowhere, um, or actually not out of nowhere, but finally coming together and coalescing into something new. And by the way, I'm the first guy to make this connection. You know, I drew this before the last couple of days, but isn't it better now? So um, the Donald Trump swamp and uh, my, my Hollywood experience, which is almost a cliche that an author gets disappointed. But more than that, it was also this, which is that last year, Harper came out with this book, as you guys know, Ghost Set a Watchman. It was pushed out by her publisher uh, in a very unfortunate decision. Uh, she was very old, and I sus very much suspect that she really had no idea about this. Uh, only the, the most tangential um, um, uh, connection to it. And I watched what was happening, and I watched how people were, were reacting to their 
beloved characters threatened, and they were. This book, uh, her characters had not formed in her head, and the, the hero, the great hero of American literature, uh, her father was also not formulated in her head when she wrote this book, and he was a villain almost in this book. And yet this was what going to be her last, lasting legacy, and her publisher didn't care, and suddenly this entire, I call it, a, it was, it's a franchise, but it's not. It's a, it's a legacy, it's, a, it's a, a conjoined memory that we all have that we grew up with and certainly influenced me, as you're going to see. And that made me think about characters, about, about brands, about, about the, 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 the way that characters live on in our fans' imaginations, how we might take it for granted, how we might take it for granted when you're very young, such as me at 24. Uh, I invented all this stuff when I was about 21. So coming back now, at this point, things have changed. I've become a father, got a little bit older, and a little more perspective, and suddenly when I saw her characters get so threatened, I thought about mine and thought, that's, I probably stepped away a little too early because I'm not ready to leave them yet. Um, this is Harper. This is her when, I was, when she was about the age that I was when I started drawing. And the real reason she's being included here is because of this book, of course, which is the book that meant everything. It was my Star Wars when I was 10. Um, it had that sort of influence on me. And it, the, the, uh, the rural landscape, the, the imagery from the book, the vivid characterizations, the iconic heroes, they all had a massive influence on me, and if you're really sharp-eyed, you can see it in nearly everything I've done since. Um, this was the imagery from the movie that had an equal amount of, of influence on me. And you'll see this is Bloom County. The reason that, I, uh, the reason that I, I drew Bloom County the way I did is because of To Kill a Mockingbird. This is a letter that I dug up that I wrote to to uh, Harper in 1967, and I said, and it was a classic assignment to write your favorite author, and I wrote her, and, and it was sent back to me because her publisher in those days was sending all fan mail back. She's never answered one. Um, and I wrote on the bottom, I was wondering if you were going to write another book. It has been a long time since you wrote this one, and it seems like there's more story to Scout's life. I, for one, would like to read it. Can you write, please, and give me an answer if you don't mind? We want more Mockingbird. Thank you very respectfully, Burke Breathed, which is what I called myself in those days. Um, this, I went on and did this sort of thing after I didn't get a response from, from Miss Lee. Um, this was, a, a year later, was my, basically my first cartoon. I was assigned any art drawing I wanted to do. I handed this in, I got an F. I can't explain why I drew it. It seemed, it's like Bloom County was just wanting to come out and at, at 11, I wasn't sure. Um, the reason this is here is because, and we're, we're, we're leaving To Kill a Mockingbird by just briefly here. This is the interim period. Um, I handed this in, got an F, brought it, took it back. She said, work on it. I showed it to my dad. He looked at it and he whispered a word in my ear and I re-handed it in. <laughs> And at 11 years old, I was reborn as a cartoonist. <laughs> so I discovered via my father's sense of humor, and that's what I inherited from, the magic of putting an image together with the right, just the right word, and it works in a way that who would have thought the power of? Um, and I was off. Now, when it came time to concoct Bloom County, they said, we don't care what you want to draw on what your comic strip is about, just start handing them in. Uh, and I'd come from college, and a college strip, which we couldn't do nationally. So I, in those days, we didn't have specific themes that they pushed on us, like babies or, or, or uh, broken marriages or divorce or, or specific themes for strips that became popular later. So I just drew To Kill a Mockingbird. I drew a small town in a rural atmosphere. I wanted to draw hills, not buildings and I wanted little kids, and I wanted adults that weren't all idiots and some heroes. Um, she didn't have a penguin, but I thought I could add on to the, to the Mockingbird legend. So th when it came time to draw it, this, this house was down the street, and that became the Bloom County Boarding House. That's Iowa City, Iowa. 
Um, and in a year, I had my first book and I was off. Anybody remember this one? A uh, funny little story with that one, they had, they had, I was brand new to stripping, uh, it was only a year old, the publisher uh, had no idea what to do, so they printed um, 10,000 as an initial print run, print run for this. Um, and I suggested since I sold 10,000 back in Austin of my own self-published book, they might want to do a little bit, a bit a, a, go a little more expansive for national distribution, and they said, uh, no, you should be very grateful that we're doing 10,000. That's really great for a beginning author. So, of course, we sold out of this one pretty quick, and we ended up selling a million point one. So they went back a few more times, and they realized um, that whatever was happening, it was new to cartooning at the time. Garfield was the only strip that had sold books. Um, and then Bill Watterson was to follow shortly, and, and, and Gary Larson, of course. So we introduced a a new era at that time. So, Bloom County went for 10 years, um, 87, 20, so 20 years later, 30 years later actually, I get this in the mail. Dear Mr. Breathed, this is a plea from a dotty old lady and from others not dotty at all. Please don't shut down Opus. Can't you at least give him a reprieve? I was about to stop comic stripping, by the way. Opus is simply the best comic strip around and et cetera, et cetera, Opus Delighted, blah, blah. I have a book, oh, she's talking about a book she's reading and then she signs it, um, I won't send you this book because I'm reading it, but please go back, much love, Harper. Okay, this is from Harper Lee. She wrote nobody. For 30 years after I wrote her and didn't get a response, urging her to bring not Mockingbird back, bring the characters back, she, not a creature, not a, uh, not a particular, um, uh, uh, not a harbor of, of great irony as a writer, she didn't appreciate the fact that she was now writing me, of all things, asking me to bring my characters back and don't let them die. Um, this is, this is, has been in my, had been in my files for 15 years, and as her new book came out uh, and made me thinking about the whole thing and reflecting back on the fact that I'm a storyteller, this is a great story. That a kid writes her at 10 and at, at 40 years old gets a letter back from her finally urging me to keep writing my product that was, that was only in existence because of her. Of course, she didn't know that. So it's, who could have thought of that? I love irony and I have really appreciate it and I almost thought that the, that the literature gods were talking to me and it was the final positive coffin, a uh, positive nail in the coffin of, of my, uh, my retirement, and I came back a year ago. So that's, in a short way, uh, explaining why I came back. And before I did, I, and, the, and the reason I'm going to show these is I had to get back. Can you imagine, 25 years later, I haven't done a daily comic strip. I haven't filled four panels since I had been a kid, and I wasn't sure that I knew how to do it again. So I went back to find if I had ever laughed at them myself. And you would think that I would have known that, but I didn't remember back in the 80s. I was so fogged um, with, with not drugs, but probably too much caffeine, that I didn't remember the things. I was drawing them so fast. I was on such a tight deadline that I never reflected on them. And I never, never went back to edit books. It was always done by other people. So for the first time, I reviewed my work. And so I, here are a few things that I found a year ago that made me laugh. I thought you'd be curious as to how embarrassing it is for an, a cartoonist to laugh at his own stuff. These are a couple of, ex bunch of examples. So Bill the Cat kissing Barbara Bush was too much for me. And I remember <laughs> giggling forever on that. Um, hold it, what's going on? <laughs> and yes, I remembered how much fun it was to mess around with the structure of comic strips which had never been messed with. And so um, that still was still held out there as, as a temptation. Uh, Cheney's outside with a Molotov cocktail. Happy hour already. <laughs> See, we're really not supposed to laugh at our own material, but I suppose we're only working if we do. Um, so there's various imagery I came across that I, I still remember enjoying reading. There was, there was Opus stretching the boundaries of comic strip newspaper propriety and, and you know... <laughs> We're going we're gonna to get to Bill Watterson in a minute, 
Um, <laughs> so yeah, I, I looked at these a year ago and go, crap, I need, I need to laugh again. So I need to see if I can make myself laugh again. So that, that's, that's why they're there. So I found the old panels from 1981 that I'd buried away in my files and scanned them and stuck them on a computer and then filled them with the first one, having no idea if I could even remember how to draw opus in a four panel strip. That's the first one that showed up in Facebook. No, no publicity, I didn't tell anybody, I didn't tell my mother, I didn't, tell my, I didn't even tell my, my spouse um, who had to take the brunt of what happened afterwards. Um, and suddenly it was there. And the reason I didn't tell anybody is because I had no idea what I was, what was going to flow out of my pen. I had not the faintest inkling. Um, and there I am a year later doing this stuff. So fortunately, this is here because it, there's plenty of material still left to do. There's stidium, stidium, plenty of life left in uh, popular culture. There's a few things that uh, I won't be doing anymore, if you might be interested. That people, because people ask me, how is it different now than it was 25 years ago? In some ways, of course, it's not. It's not different at all, except this isn't showing up in newspapers, and I don't have over 1,000 editors, which I used to before. Happy to get rid of those. Um, what's changed is that, remember, in the 80s, if you can remember, or were alive then, um, as far as social satire or comedy of recent events, there was The Tonight Show monologue, and there was Saturday Night Live, and there was Doonesbury, which is heavily political, but that was it. There was no internet, there was no snark, there was no TMZ, there was nothing. So what you won't see from me now, unless I'm really weak on a particular day, is uh, celebrity humor. Um, it's covered by everybody else. I'm not gonna do Kenya jokes, or I'm not gonna do Kardashian jokes if I can help it, or if my, my, my wife Heather can stop me first. She, um, um, it's no longer funny to me anymore. And maybe it has something to do with the fact that uh, uh, six years ago, I was uh, scootering along the sidewalk downtown Santa Barbara with my son, Milo, who you know now, uh, and he was 11 maybe. And we pass a chap walking on the sidewalk on one of the uh, side roads from the main street of, of Santa Barbara, looking like he was looking for something. And I went by fast and I recognized him. I went, crap, this is out of, out of body moment. And I said, Milo, come back. So we rolled back to this guy and I felt bad rolling up to him because he's the kind of guy that probably is very leery of people coming up too fast. And it was Barry Manilow. And now I had, I had made lots of fun of Barry Manilow over the years in the 80s. <laughs> and um, fortunately, I had a very good reason to come back to him. And I said, don't, don't run, I'm, you, you, I don't know if you remember, but I'm Berkeley Breathed, I did a comic strip name. And he immediately lit up because he remembered the reason why I was, had turned around actually to come back to him, which is that when I broke my back in 1987 in a flying accident, uh, the very first and largest bouquet of flowers the size of a of, of Volkswagen showed up in my, in my uh, hospital room from Barry Manilow. <laughs> now, I had mocked this guy, like I'd mentioned, for years and years, mocked his music, and this wasn't ironic. He, didn't, he wasn't doing this as an ironic winking joke. It was said, get, get well soon and get back to the newspapers. He had a sense of humor about himself, and he really didn't deserve to because he, he's been treated, he, he was treated badly. Um, and it, it injected a little bit of humanity into the fact that we, we hold a certain power and just because you're famous and just because you're in the medium doesn't mean you don't have feelings. And just the possibility that I might have actually hurt his feelings suddenly at a later age now, now that I'm a dad and I have kids and I have daughters, their feelings are hurt all the time, it wouldn't have mattered that they're famous. So I can't draw a comic strip making fun of, a, of anybody that just because they're famous. So that you ask what's changed, that's changed. I don't think the world is at a loss because I'm no longer doing that. Um, uh, politics is off the grid, that's fine. Um, so that's, that's one of the changes that I did and I was able to leave Barry shaking hands and uh, wishing him very well. 
Um, and it was a nice, nice bit of closure because I never had a chance to thank him for that. So that doesn't happen very often. Now, this is uh, one of the, my other book that I'm out now. I'm trying an experiment to take the, the world's least likely children's character <laughs> and to turn him into a children's story. So I will be at the, uh, at the Penguin booth, which is 2204 at 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 5 o'clock, signing this book. Uh, if you'd like to look, check it out for your children or grandchildren and see. I'm going to run through this real quick. Uh, this is a story of, uh, this is an origin story of Bill the Cat, as, as dramatic as, uh, as Darth Vader, I'm sure. And he's, he was adopted by Binkley as a very small boy until he was yanked away and sent off to the North Pole um, while leaving Binkley forever bereft of his buddy and trying to turn trying to relive those glory days of having a cat sleep on his head. Um, while Bill the Cat went on to various adventures and he became a god to many cultures in Egypt and he was lured um, away by aliens and he eventually escaped and I'm cutting this story very short, it's a very big one. And he came back into Opus's life and uh, Opus brought him back to Bloom County where, like the rest of us, we all return, uh, and he's rejoined Binkley's life. That's that. I've just ruined the dramatic story for you if you haven't bought the book. But your children don't know that, that story, so I please, I ask you to check it out. You can tell that I had a lot of fun painting the pictures.